Hello once again, my name is Andrew Dunkley and welcome to another edition of Space Nuts. Uh, coming up on this episode, black holes. Well, we know they exist. We don't know a heck of a lot about them. We've only imaged two of them, in fact, but they have found a new one. It's, uh, it's actually a new class of black hole and it's enormous and it's just over there. Uh, we'll also be talking about the last universal common ancestor. It's older than we thought, and it is basically what made life as we know it come into existence. And space junk in the news again for all the wrong reasons. That's coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And I have to be very careful about where I'm pointing when I'm talking about uh, the discovery of a black hole because I was pointing straight at my wife. Anyway, uh, joining us as well to discuss all that, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. <laughs> I'm in trouble uh, you already. Could point, you, yeah, you could point to it, actually, because um, this black hole is one that is in our southern sky. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably circumpolar, which means it always goes around the sky. It might not be quite circumpolar, but it's getting on that way. Mm, okay. Well, um, we'll talk about that and all those other things. Um, first of all, though, how are you and how have you been? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, recovered from our uh, Outback tour a couple of weeks ago. That's still fresh in our memory, though, some of the things we saw, the extraordinary. Uh, Which uh, reminds me, Fred, uh, we have a note from Tracy. You talked about Tracy the other day who won the auction. To, yes, she um, did. For your book. Yeah. Uh, she sent us a note. Hi, Fred and Andrew. Tracy Hill here. Thanks for the shout out. Have clipped the segment to put on my Facebook page for family and friends yeah. to listen. But, but it was a great this. night and have just started the book. I will submit my questions soon. Mm. So. There you are. Well, that's, that's paradoxical because that book is actually, the one she got was Where's Uranus Upside Down, which is all <laughs> questions. The whole book's questions. So <laughs> she's got plenty to go from. Fortunately, I could just read out the answers. <laughs> yes, yes. But you know what? I, when you, what we've discovered with uh, discoveries in space is they always throw up more questions, and questions tend to throw up follow up questions. It's. It's just the way of humanity, isn't it? We've always got questions. Indeed it is. Mm. We're full of questions. Every, every answer to a question tends to spawn a new question in the, uh, in the world of astronomy and space science. Yes. I, I expect we'll get a uh, shout-out from Tracy after we gave her a shout-out after she got the shout-out. So this could keep going around and around. Let's, uh, let's get on to it. Uh, our first topic is that of a black hole. Uh, this is um, a, a recently categorised a variety of black hole because it is um, what they call intermediate. Uh, and that was one we talked about mm, probably a couple of years ago when they yeah, – we I, I think the way it went, we were talking about the different sizes of black holes one episode and we said, look, they are, they're either small or massive, but we can't find anything in between. And honestly, within a month, I think they found one. Yes. And now, <laughs> and now they've found another one. Yeah. Yeah, and this one's um... – Really significant because I think this is a a very uh, you know pretty s a solid discovery of, uh, of, a, of an intermediate what's called an intermediate black intermediate mass black hole. Um, so well, let's just go through the details because black holes do come in basically two flavors: uh, the stellar mass black holes, which, as the name suggests, are about the mass of a star. Uh, in fact, they're the mass of a massive star usually. 10, 20 times the mass of our sun. Uh, so our sun won't turn into a black hole. But when, when one of these massive stars ends its life, runs out of fuel, the core collapses and nothing will stop the collapse and you get a black hole at the end of it. Um, and we recognise those. Uh, there are several in our galaxy. We recognise them by the effect on their surroundings. They're usually swallowing up stuff and, issue, and um, emitting X-rays. The other end of the scale is the supermassive black holes, uh, which are millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. And we think there's one of these at the middle of every galaxy. We've talked about them a lot. Uh, there is certainly one at the middle of our galaxy. It's about 4 million times the mass of the sun in the constellation of Sagittarius at a distance of about 25,000 light years. So quite a long way off. Uh, not doing much at the moment, although it does occasionally swallow a gas cloud and get bright in the infrared and, uh, and radio 
uh, spectra, uh, but uh, is invisible at, visible at optical wavelengths, that's to say the wavelength of visible light. Um, so uh, uh, physicists think, astrophysicists think that the supermassive black holes get that way by lots of black holes coming together. In other words, right. over time, uh, they accrete other black holes. So they basically, you know, gobble up other black holes and you get this thing that's growing up to millions of times the mass of the sun or more. Um, that's been thrown a little bit into question recently by the fact that we see some of these supermassive black holes very early in the history of the universe. That's mm. results that have come from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, but we still have this gap in the middle. Um, what why don't we see anything that's on its way to becoming a supermassive black hole, for example? Why don't we see something that's bigger than thousands of times a stellar mass black hole? And these are the things we would call intermediate black holes, black holes with a mass in the region of uh, thousands to tens of thousands of the mass of the sun. So where would you look to try and find these? What you might look for <laughs> is things that we think are the remnants of a galaxy that's been stopped from evolving. Uh, so if you, if you imagine a, a, a young galaxy uh, with its stars, maybe a bit of spiral arms and things of that sort coming on, and a, and a nucleus of old stars, and then you suck it into another galaxy... Um, what you might get left with is the sort of nucleus of stars from the, the galaxy that's been swallowed up, plus its black hole uh, that would be in the middle of that. And um, because uh, what you've done is you've taken this galaxy out of the evolution stakes, in other words, you've stopped it growing, maybe uh, the black hole would stop growing as well. And so this might be a way of finding these intermediate black uh, mass black holes. And the scenario that I've just elaborated is exactly what we think is the mechanism by which globular clusters are formed. These are clusters of stars that have been known uh, for, well, many, many um, hundreds of years. In fact, uh, it was William Herschel who gave them the name globular clusters because they look globular. Um, and they're, they're swarms of stars, uh, up to a million stars in the biggest ones, uh, and very, very tightly packed together, Andrew. So they're, you know, they're, the, the, the stars are all not exactly bumping into one another, but very, very close. Uh, and the thinking is that these are the nuclei, the centres of galaxies that were stripped off, um, that had their, their outer regions stripped off because they were being uh, swallowed up by another galaxy, in this case, our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, and we've got something like, it's probably up to about 200 globular clusters that swarm around the Milky Way galaxy. And the thinking is that they are the, the remnants of baby galaxies that were dragged out of uh, the space around the Milky Way and have just become part of the Milky Way, and their outer stars uh, were swallowed up by the Milky Way, but what's left is this tightly packed nucleus of old stars. We know that globular cluster stars are very old. And so what has happened is that the, uh, the, the biggest of these things in our sky uh, is a globular cluster called uh, Omega Centauri, uh, and that is in the constellation of Centaurus in the southern sky, one that we see very clearly from here in the southern hemisphere. Uh, it's actually one of the reasons why telescopes in the southern hemisphere are important. The two biggest globular clusters uh, are in the southern sky. Um, anyway, uh, uh, scientists have studied the black hole, sorry, the globular cluster Omega Centauri uh, by putting together a very large number of images, more than 500 uh, images of this cluster taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And the thing about the Space Telescope is it's very, very accurate in the way it can position the stars. You know, you can look at it and your, your images will show uh, stars as they are at that moment. But if the stars are moving, if they're circulating around something, then having 500 of them that have been taken over over a long period will give you almost like a time-lapse movie of what's going on uh, in Omega Centauri. 
And what they've done is they've done that uh, and basically revealed uh, a place where stars are moving in such a way that we believe there is an intermediate mass black hole in the middle. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's one of these things where you're actually searching for something and, and you're using the right tools uh, and uh, basically they have found it. Um, that is the, uh, that's the current outcome of this research. There's some nice uh, pictures of the centre of the globular cluster Omega Centauri taken with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, on the web. They're easily, easy to find. Uh, and the nice thing about the story is that um, uh, whilst the science, the science team were led by scientists from the uh, Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Germany, uh, there are University of Queensland researchers um, as, as well involved with the team. So Astro Australian astronomers are mixed up with this, which is brilliant. Um, and it looks as though this is the first really definitive evidence of, um, of an of, of a intermediate mass black hole. Now, I hope the next question you're going to ask me, Andrew, is how do they know that it's 20,000 time, 20, times the mass of the sun? That was going to be my second question, but yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> what was your first one going to be? Uh, I forget. No, oh, okay. it was. Um, <laughs> no, I'll get. I'll get to it because now you, what you've brought up is probably a more important aspect of it at the moment. But I'll, I'll get to the um, uh, question I had in mind in a tick. So uh, how do they know it's twenty thousand times the mass of our sun? I thought you'd never ask me that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, by so when you if you can detect stars moving around, um, which is what's happened here, uh, and you what you can do is you can say, well, these stars are moving in a gravitational field, uh, and you, you need several stars to to do this. One's not really enough, but if you've got several stars, you can uh, you can basically track the way they're moving, um, and from that you can deduce what the sort of centre of attraction is. What is the thing that they're moving around? Uh, because they'll be in orbit around something. Everything's yeah. in orbit around something. Uh, and so um, that's how you can measure the mass because you, uh, once you model their movement, you, you basically, uh, it's very simple um, mathematics, actually. It's Kepler's laws go back to the early uh, 17th century. Um, when Kepler formulated these laws that tell you how things move in a gravitational field. He didn't know it was moving in a gravitational field, but that's what's happening. Uh, and so from that, you can deduce how massive the object is at the center. Uh, mm. And the answer in this case is 20,000 solar masses. Um, it's exactly how we've measured the mass of the of Sagittarius A star, the uh, black hole at the center of our own galaxy, uh, because there are stars that you can see actually orbiting that, uh, which have been measured uh, by two, two different telescopes, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the very large telescope, others by the uh, Gemini telescopes in Hawaii. Uh, so we've got two independent research groups that have done that work, and we've got a, that, this is the work on the centre of our own galaxy. And, and the mass has been measured by, by this motion of the stars. So it's, it's a really nice piece of research uh, and mm. very exciting for the world of astronomy. So what was your second question? Well, uh, um, you mentioned Sagittarius A star, which we've managed to image. Uh, and we know that one's at the centre of our galaxy. Uh, this one uh, they've found is probably the nearest of its kind to Earth, which is a, a sobering thought. It's not really that far away. What, about a 1,000 light years or something? Uh, no, it's 18,000. 18,000. Uh, oh, like I feel that. better. Yeah, you feel, feel happy. Better. Yeah, good. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's a recent discovery. It's also a, a rare black hole in terms of size. Um, how many more are floating around in our galaxy? Because we 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 assume most galaxies have a black hole at it at the centre, but um, I, you've probably answered the question partially in terms of the reference to globular clusters. But yeah. uh, if we know how many globular globular clusters there are, we have a better idea of how many potential black holes there might be. Is that a fair quite, point, or is that so. just to do with the no. intermediate size? Yes, that's the intermediate size. That's right. But no, but you're absolutely right. Um, if if a globular cluster is the smoking gun to have a, a you know 
intermediate mass black hole at the centre. They may all have a, a, one of these black holes at the centre. We haven't made that discovery yet. Um, I think, I can't remember the number of globular clusters at the last count. I think it's between 160 and 200, if I remember rightly, associated with our own galaxy. Uh, when you look at the Andromeda galaxy, there are many, many more. Uh, they've got many mm. more globulars up there. But um, but no, you're, you, you're right. Um, what that does is it, it points to the fact that we might have uh, in intermediate, in terms of intermediate mass black holes, we might have a lot of them in our galaxy. Um, we've got a lot of stellar mass black holes as well. And I think the nearest of those is about a thousand light years away, but that's only 20 times the mass of the sun or something like that. Um, so uh, the question I thought you were going to ask... <laughs> Which is Fred's way of saying, I'd like to mention this next. <laughs> well, you mentioned that we've imaged the black hole at the centre of our galaxy, yeah. um, the Sagittarius A star black hole. I thought you might ask, can we image the uh, intermediate mass black hole at the well, centre of now the... Now that they've found a potential location, can yeah. they? Probably not. <laughs> and the reason, it, even though it's nearer, so 18,000 light years away compared with 25,000 light years, uh, even though it's nearer, it's much, much smaller. Remember the Sagittarius A star black hole is 4 million times the mass of the sun. This is 20,000 times the mass of the sun. So its okay. event horizon will be a much smaller, you know, a much smaller diameter. That means it's going to be much, much harder to image. And I suspect we'll, with the present, level of equipment, certainly we'll never see an image of it. Okay. So what you're saying is in universal terms, size matters. Yeah. Uh, it may, well, it, that's right. And it may even be, sorry, um, just to take a step further. Uh, the reason why this black hole is intermediate mass is because it hasn't grown. And it hasn't grown because there's no hydrogen around it to suck in and turn into energy. Uh, and, and basically build the size of the black hole. So um, it's because what you see with the Event Horizon Telescope, when we look at these supermassive black holes and try and image their event horizon, you're seeing the effects of the accretion disk, the stuff that's whizzing around it uh, and making it glow. And if that's not happening in the... Omega Centauri black hole, we're not going to see it. We're never going to see it. It will just be a black hole with nothing to delineate it from its surroundings, apart mm. from the fact that it's pulling stars around. And that's, uh, so that's the, as I said, the smoking gun. Yes. Yes. It's a fabulous discovery, though, because uh, as we've mentioned a few times over the years, um, we didn't know if these existed. And when we did, well, uh, the, you know, there aren't that many of them. So finding one. <laughs> Uh, in our vicinity is uh, it's pretty impressive work, uh, indeed. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a little break from the show to tell you about our sponsor, Incogni. And if you've ever had your information harvested from the World Wide Web, this is the tool for you. Uh, of course, your information is easily available online. Uh, we're talking personal information. We're talking addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, uh, even bank details if your protection isn't good enough. Uh, this stuff gets harvested and it is sold by data brokers. Uh, they sell it to other people who then scam you or other people in your name, which is happening a lot. Uh, I've found my information on the dark web on several occasions in recent years uh, and managed to uh, clean it up. But the more I clean it up, the more I have to clean it up because it just keeps going around and around and around. Uh, chances are you uh, regularly get those shonky emails and te uh, texts about uh, winning something. That's a common one. Uh, or your uh, mail being lost, the package couldn't be delivered. Uh, could be anything, could be anything. And of course, there's a link on these very handy emails and texts to help you out, but it's actually the opposite. They are basically hoping you'll fall for it and give them information that will now then enable them to scam you to the tune of hundreds or even thousands or worst case scenario, tens of thousands of dollars. And there's been a lot of cases of that in recent times. In fact, in 2022 alone, the number of scams rose by 41.5% globally. 
So what is the solution? Well, the solution is you can go online and clear out your personal data by yourself if you've got a couple of years up your sleeve because that's how long it will take you. And that's not a joke. It will take a couple of years. Uh, and when you've done it, of course, other information of yours is already back online. They just keep collecting it regardless. Or you can use a ready-made solution and that is Incogni. And as a Space Nuts uh, listener, you get a special deal with Incogni at the moment. Uh, it is simple. It works in the background. It provides ongoing protection. So you can sit back, relax, and know that Incogni is protecting you from these harvesters and scammers. And all you have to do is create an account, give Incogni permission to work on your behalf, and that's it. Job done. And if you want to check out the pricing, there's a 60% off deal for Space Nuts listeners at the moment. That is fantastic. Uh, just go to incogni.com slash Space Nuts for more information. That's incogni.com slash Space Nuts. And look at the pricing for individual plans or you can get a family and friends plan. Just depends on the circumstances. But uh, at the moment, 60% off the annual individual plan and 60% off the family and friends plan. Check it all out at incogni.com slash space nuts and see what works for you. But uh, peace of mind is probably um, yeah uh, something that we all need in this uh, this world of data thieves. So uh, check it out today, incogni.com slash space nuts. Now back to the show. Roger, you're live, sir, you're also. Space nuts. Now, Fred, uh, we are going to talk about what spawned life as we know it uh, on Earth, and that was the last universal common ancestor. Uh, and the reason this story has come up is because we appear to have um, uh, started to do, develop life as we know it much sooner than they thought. Uh, I suppose we should start by explaining what LUCA is all about. Yes, yeah, so so LUCA is an acronym uh, for the last universal common ancestor. I don't know whether you notice uh, a bit of background noise there, Andrew, and that I've gone dark. Uh, there is a delightful lady uh, who is pulling uh, the paint off uh, <laughs> off. The paint, not the paint, but the paint limitations off our screen. I'm going to show you. Oh, what oh she okay. Looks like. She throws a few of my hair. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes. Yeah. Will Will she ever know that she just went around the world? I don't think so. I don't think she will. <laughs> uh, she's she's pulling the, t the tape off that uh, that that keeps the keeps yeah. the um, thing. <laughs> It keeps it keeps the paint from spreading where it shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, I hope she doesn't didn't mind that. She's a delightful young woman, so that's fine. Um, so um, the uh, what we're talking about the last Luca. universal common ancestor. <laughs> okay, so uh, it, it uh, it's an idea. I mean, it, and it's well established, and and of course this is of great interest to astrobiologists because the. Um, uh, origin of life on Earth is the only model we've got for the origin of life anywhere. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, if life is going to form on other worlds, uh, we uh, want to understand how that might that process might happen. Uh, and our evolutionary biologists who look at this kind of thing, they are basically uh, um, putting putting the steps together to try and understand. What is at the root of life? So um, Luca is, uh, as I said, it is um, last universal common ancestor. It is, and it's kind of hypothetical in a way, Andrew, because it, it may not be. It, it's probably not just one single microbe, uh, but it is probably a lot of them, uh, which are all the same, uh, and they may even have formed those microbial mats that we that. Marnie and I and our tour group were looking at uh, in the uh, uh, Eddie Akara um, uh, fossil beds uh, a week or so, not much more than a week ago. Yeah. Uh, my, microbes are the, the basic, you know, the basic fundamental entities of life, single-celled organisms. So um, we have 
really good reason to believe that if you look back far enough, you will come to this LUCA, this single-celled organism. It, basically, it is a, it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a category of organisms, if I can put it that way. Um, now, that then evolved um, into what we call the tree of life. I looked into this a while ago because I'm giving talks about it, and I have to say, and I'll preface this with the disclaimer to the people who I know listen to this this podcast who know a lot more about life processes and medicine than I do. Um, I'll preface it by the disclaimer that I know nothing about uh, biology or living organisms, uh, but what I read is of great interest. Uh, as I said, I did a talk about Luca and the origins of life, and um, I don't know whether the audience realised I had no idea what I was talking about, but you know, they clapped <laughs> at the end and seemed to be fine, you know. I, I did that for 40 years on radio. So. Yeah, you did, yeah. We're still doing it, Andrew. We're still doing it. <laughs> we haven't found out yet. Okay, so the tree of life, three main branches, hmm. uh, bacteria, archaea, and uh, eukarya. Uh, and the eukarya uh, basically are the eu eu uh, eukaryotic, I think, life forms. I think that's the adjective, eukaryotic. Um, and that includes us, <laughs> pretty well yeah. everything that we, we know. It's plants, animals, and fungi. Um, so the, the, all of these are descendants from Luca, the bacteria, the archaea, that, that's two different classes of, of sort of fairly rudimentary life forms, and the eukarya, uh, which are us and everything around us. So, you know, I'm looking out at, at, at a lawn and trees uh, going up the rock face at, behind our house. That's all part of the eukarya, eukaryotic life. As, as is Hugh, because he's a fun guy. <laughs> Hugh, Hugh is, because he's a fun guy. <laughs> I thought you were going to be nice to Hugh today. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it, because I know he's watching today. And if, oh, oh. You know, one day you and I are going to be in mid-sentence and the whole thing's going to go black and that'll be the <laughs> end of it. Or you'll burst <laughs> in. That's probably what'll happen. When Hugh pulls the plug. Um, <laughs> Gosh, we're struggling with this story. I keep getting distracted. Yes, it's all right. Anyway, um, and I'm going to read um, a little quote from a very nice article by uh, Evering Yaskin, who's a, a, a journalist with Cosmos. Um, but, uh, it's an Australian science journal, very, very well-respected uh, Australian science journal. Uh, he's got some very nice uh, sentences in here, which is I'm going to quote him. Um, uh, all Luca's descendants share the same amino acids, which build proteins in cellular organisms, the same energy, uh, the same basic cellular machinery and DNA used to store information. Uh, so understanding Earth's earliest ecosystem and what the environment was like when Luca lived has been a major plank of scientific endeavor. But first, uh, and this is cutting the, to the chase, and um, I, um, I hope uh, everyone won't find me <laughs> quoting this, but it's great. He's written it very well. But first, researchers had to determine how long ago Luca lived. Um, and, and just an aside from me, you need to know that because you want to know what the geology is telling you that the Earth was like then. Um, you, you know, you can, you can think about Luca, but you need to know what sort of environment... Um, what sort of environment was uh, was there? So um, we did not. Uh, sorry, let me see. Yeah. So first, researchers had to determine how long ago Luca lived, using genetic information and known time separation between species from the fossil record. Scientists have now determined that Luca lived 4.2 billion years ago. Um, and this is the crux of the matter. This is what the surprise is. And I'm quoting again from, uh, from yeah, uh, Ephraim's article. Uh, we did not expect Luca to be so old within just hundreds of millions of years of the Earth's formation, which, by the way, was 4.57 billion years ago. Uh, says, <laughs> I said that last bit, but says Sandra Alvarez Caratero from the University of Bristol, UK, co-author of the study published in Nature, uh, Ecology and Evolution. However, our results fit in with modern views on the habitability of early Earth. That's the thing. Um, if, you, if you do what they've done, and it's actually similar, it's similar to a process that took place, I think, in the 6th century when 
uh, and I can't remember his name. That's terrible. Uh, he was a monk, effectively, uh, 6th century AD. He worked out the age of the world from biblical accounts just by saying, well, this took that long, this took that long, this took that long, this took that long. And that's how he knew that the world was created 4,000 years ago. Uh, so 4,000 BC. Um, I've forgotten his name. It doesn't matter. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, Dionysius. Dion 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 Dionysius. That's right. Dionysius. Dionysius. Th thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well done. Well done, that man on the Google. Uh, <laughs> Dionysius. Uh, so he did, he did exactly this process. He sort of thought about what we knew from the biblical account in terms of when, uh, you know, how long people lived, how, how often they did stuff, when they did it. And by that, he was able to work out that the Earth was formed. I think he got it accurate to a couple of years, 4004 BC, if I remember rightly, which certain... Um, branches of the church still hold that that's when when the creation took place mm. and we've got a different story 30.8 billion years um, which comes from slightly different uh, you know slightly different reasoning but uh, just going back to the, the Luca story that's what they've done and they've looked at the genetic information that tells you the time separation between the way species have evolved from the fossil record and so now you get this uh, origin of Luca 4.2 billion years ago. Um, and that's really quite remarkable. It is. Uh, but there's more, which I haven't oh. read about yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a minute. Let me see if I can get to it. No, I can't. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. So this, again, is a quote uh, actually from... Uh, a Bristol University of Bristol professor of phylogenomics, whose name is David Pizante, Pizanti. David says, our study shows that Luca was a complex organism not too different from modern prokaryotes, which are part of the, the, the modern you know, bacterial species. Uh, but what is really interesting is that it's clear it possessed an early immune system, showing mm. that even by 4.2 billion years ago, our ancestor was engaging in an arms race with viruses. What about that? Yeah, that's amazing. So we, yeah, it throws a whole new light on, on the origin of life as we know it. And, and speaking of which, and yes. it takes it, it takes it <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, but it takes it back further, and it looks like um, this started very early in the life of, uh, yes. of the planet, which is even yeah. more staggering. And I suppose that adds a little bit more confidence to the argument that there could have been life on Mars. And I wonder if that's the sort of thing they're looking for with. Um, yeah. With yeah. their investigations at the moment, uh, the, the, Look, these Luca um, type of events. That's right, Luca on Mars. What a interesting thing. I mean, it's always been said that um, you know, as soon as we do find any evidence, fossilized or otherwise, of microbial life on Mars, assuming that we do, I don't know whether we will, but if you assume that they do, the first thing that you're going to want to do is look at its genetic sequencing, get down to the molecular level, mm. and, it, and you might find that it's got the same ancestry as we have, that it's got the same LUCA. Uh, and that would be remarkable because that means that life on the two planets would have had the same origin. And it flourished on Earth because we had the right kind of climate, whereas Mars, being smaller, just went cold and dry and um, life probably didn't survive. Yeah, we had a better bowl of soup. We did, basically, yeah, yeah. Prim primordial soup. We had and of balls. course, just to to sort of wind this story up, the um, and you did refer to it early on. This also creates uh, uh, the potential for uh, Luca style of life being created in other worlds if the recipe is right. So yeah. it opens that door, particularly when you consider how long ago it happened, much sooner than we thought, and that. Could have kind of paves the way for the potential for life to get a, a little bit of a foothold in other worlds if the if the yeah. conditions are, are perfectly right, mm. or even not perfectly right. They could start to flourish and then the atmosphere changes and everything goes well. Better off. off. 
Mm, yeah. yeah, fascinating stuff. Uh, yes, and you can read all about it uh, on the cosmosmagazine.com website. Let's see. Space nuts. Now, Fred, to uh, a story that uh, is a little bit concerning, probably a lot concerning, and one that we only spoke about very recently with a piece of space junk from the International Space Station going through a house in Florida yeah. in March. Uh, now we've got uh, reports of space junk uh, coming down all over the planet, um, not you know in quick succession, but this is starting to become very common and they're worried that the, the time will come where somebody becomes a fatality. This is very concerning. That, that's correct, yeah. And um, the... The, the principle, uh, the sort of common theme of the particular bits of space junk that we've spoken about um, is not so much the, um, the Starlink spacecraft, of which there are now, you know, what is it, 7,000 or something in orbit, uh, being launched almost at um, 20, 20 every two or three days. Um, the, the, the main culprit seems to be the trunking of the Crew Dragon space capsule. So Crew Dragon is a is a something that looks a lot like you know it's conical. It looks a lot like the old Apollo spacecraft. Uh, and but Crew Dragon has a what's called a cargo trunk uh, that is uh, the the cylindrical part that connects the conical capsule to the to the launch vehicle um, because the Bits of debris that have been found, and we found them here in Australia, uh, exactly as you mentioned, that uh, stuff that came through the roof in Florida. Um, there's something uh, been found in North Carolina, uh, some stuff that's been found in Canada. Uh, and uh, they all seem to have this common theme, that they are bits of the, of the trunking, the trunk that uh, joins the two bits of the spacecraft together, um, yeah. which clearly don't burn up in the atmosphere. Um, and even though well, everybody when said... You, when you look at images of it, it is a huge piece of apparatus. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm not yeah. surprised it doesn't burn up. The, the thing's as big as a truck. Well, that, that's right. I think some of the uh, some of the lumps that have come down have been, yeah, very sizable pieces of, pieces of kit. Uh, and um, they, well, they're... They're interesting bits of stuff that are coming down. Things that have been to space are always interesting, but as mm. you say, there is a there is danger associated with that. And what some of the commentators are saying about this is, it's only a matter of time uh, before somebody seriously hurt or killed by falling space junk. Yes, and even though there are laws in place, the 1972 Liability Convention uh, states that nations are responsible for whatever yeah. they put up there and disposing of it. But the problem uh, that has been created now with practically um, you know, rocket launches every day yeah. uh, or every other day uh, is that when it comes to civilians, it's a different story. And yes, yes. This, this is, the, the concern is that... It won't be long before lawsuits start getting um, yeah. registered due to damage or even death of people on Earth being struck by debris. And we saw that recently in Florida, as we spoke yeah. about a few weeks ago. So yeah. it, it, is an on, it, it is an ongoing concern and one that seems to be escalating. This is starting to pop up all over the over the planet, as you mentioned, the most recent being Saskatchewan. And I, 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 I was amused by... Um, uh, the remedy for that was found by farmers and apparently um, the SpaceX company sent two employees in a rented truck to pick the pieces up and paid the farmers for the fragments, which, you know, sounds a bit comical, but um, what if it killed someone? Yeah, different story right. then. It was very different. Yeah, mm. very different. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's... it's uh, I, I hope it never happens, but with so much stuff going up and coming down and not coming down well, it, it stands to reason that uh, mathematically, statistically, um, something terrible is going to happen. Mm. Uh, dovetailing into that story, Fred, is um, a, a, a failure with the uh, Falcon 9 Heavy um, with a launch recently, and uh, this was to deploy 20 Starlink satellites. 
uh, which they did deploy, but apparently because of the failure, they couldn't get them to a, a decent enough altitude. So they'll all be lost. This is a bit of a shock because this is a very, very reliable piece of hardware. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a standard Falcon 9 rather than the Falcon 9 Heavy. Um, for the, the Falcon 9, yeah, oh, okay. the, the, they've had, um, yeah, it's uh, slightly different. What is it? The number of launches, successful launches, 364 successful launches of the Falcon 9 system, uh, um, carrying astronauts as well as, you know, various payloads for their commercial clients and thousands and thousands of Starlink satellites. Uh, one, uh, the last the last time there was a problem uh, was an explosion on the launch pad in September 2016. Uh, yeah. That is getting on for eight years ago. So it's, um, it's pretty, you know, it, it's pretty... Uh, pretty uh, reliable as a piece of space hardware. And that's what you want when you're sending astronauts up and down using it. Um, so what's happened this time is it was the second stage of the launch vehicle that uh, that failed uh, because it had developed a liquid oxygen leak. Um, and so it couldn't uh, carry out a, a second burn. In other words, you've got what you've got. You've, you've got the uh, the first stage, which actually returned quite safely to the to the the drone ship. Um, probably, uh, yes. I still, love, of course, I still love you. That's the name of one of them. <laughs> the others just read the instructions. Um, that it re- returned. I don't know which one it went to. There's another one too. Uh, but um, but it landed safely on the drone ship. Second stage had a burn to separate it from the first stage but then there was another one to inject the starlink 20 starlink satellites that it was carrying into their proper orbits and that failed because of this Mm. oxygen leak and so what happened was the starlink satellites basically uh i think uh 15 of them just came back to earth they just burned up uh they thought they could save five of them by using their own thrusters to increase their orbit because they they you know they 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 the orbit that that the second stage put these satellites in was unsustainable its low point was only 135 kilometers which is well in the atmosphere uh and would um you know would would cause it to burn up very quickly uh they were trying to use the thrusters on and, and five of them to lift their orbits and save them but i don't think that happened no now, the, the story i hear is they just couldn't do it and they've all been lost uh and, and that's because uh of that oxygen leak and therefore the booster failure but uh it only they, i think they only got to an altitude that was half that required to be a, a success so it, they were on a hiding to nothing by the sound of it uh that's correct um Sorry, I'm just uh, answering a phone call on my watch. <laughs> Talk about the future. Um, the the so, sorry, Andrew, to be distracted there, but um, the, the the main issue is that there are two forthcoming launches as we speak today. Uh, we're recording this on the 16th of July. Uh, two reco- uh, launches. One is a cargo launch, July 19th, but the other is a crewed launch. Uh, on the 31st of July uh, Mm. for a project called Polaris Dawn, which is a private mission. And Polaris Dawn itself is pretty interesting, actually. It's a private human spaceflight mission. Um, It's uh, it's a billionaire who's funding it. SpaceX will operate it with a Crew Dragon capsule, uh, and it's the first of three planned missions. But it's a bit like, do you remember we talked... Uh, a few weeks ago about um, the uh, medical details that had come from uh, a private mission called, I think it was Inspiration4, yes. uh, w- which had uh, medical people on board. And so they were able to give real-time measurements of, uh, of, of people's blood pressure and you know, skin temperature, all of that sort of stuff yeah. uh, that provided a wealth of data that we talked about that said basically space flight Yes, it knocks you about a bit, but within three months of getting back to Earth, you're pretty well back to where you started with. And there was the mm. issue of the telomeres growing. In fact, um, right. uh, one of one of our regular listeners, Heidi de Block, who's a, a, a 
space med medic, uh, she commented uh, on on texts uh, received from her about that how interesting that was the the the, the research that came from that inspiration for uh, mission. This is different. It's a different one. It's a different billionaire. It's a different name, Polaris Storm. But they will do experiments. They'll do um, you know experiments in the flight. Uh, so it's a private company once again uh, taking flight using a crew dragon. Now that. Mission must currently be in doubt with the uh, with the failure of the uh, Falcon Nine launch that we've just been talking about. Mm. Yes, and of course the ongoing uh, issue with um, the Starliner, Boeing Starliner, and the um, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's sort of, are still on the International well. Space Station, wait, <laughs> waiting to come back. Uh, so it, yeah, and and all it, you know, what this does is it, it it kind of underlines how precarious and dangerous space flight is. I know we're yeah. taking it for granted more and more these days, but it only needs to be just a slight change in circumstances that could lead to something horrible happening. Yes. Um, the fact that it was an, uh, there were no people on the space, uh, the Falcon 9 that uh, ran into trouble is great news, but as you said, there are missions coming up which will be taking people into space and yeah, if they're going to have to have a look at what went wrong and see if they can figure it out so they can avoid it in the future. Um, we'll wait and see on that one. Uh, and, of course, if you want to chase up those uh, space junk and uh, SpaceX stories, they're at spacedaily.com. Uh, that brings us to the end. Fred, thank you very much. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Andrew. We've covered a lot of ground today. And uh, sure look forward, I look forward to the next time. Indeed, which could be very, 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 yeah. very, very oh, soon. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. We'll see you. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and thanks to Hugh in the studio who turned up today. I haven't seen him do anything yet, but I'm sure he'll do something later. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. See you on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.